Okay. Um, for those who don't know, we are studying a Sabbath school lesson from back in 1888. Um, it was a, a quarter's lesson back there. And we're currently on lesson number 11 in this particular study guide. And my understanding, we got to question 22 last week. I wasn't here last week. Um, we got to lesson 22. But what we're talking a little bit about at this particular time, oh, and if any of you would like a copy of this lesson and you don't have it, message Faye, she can send it to you. Um, so what we're talking about at this particular time the, the lesson as a whole is the three angels message the and the national Sunday law, basically, um, or, or the mark of the beast, I should say. And so right now we're looking at the Sunday law being instituted. And the question, question 21 in the lesson says, by what power was Sunday keeping instituted? And this is particularly talking about in the past. Now, like I said, this lesson was from 1888, and so um, this is actually looking at even prior to that time when Sunday laws were instituted. Um, what was the power that was behind them being instituted at that time? And I see everybody's microphone is muted. Just want you to know, too, this is a class. This is not a lecture, um, and so it is anticipated that you will be speaking. Um, so if you want to mute, unmute when you're ready to speak, or if you want to just unmute it now so you're ready at any time, that's up to you. But the, the question is, what power actually instituted um, Sunday keeping in the past? The church. Thank you. <laughs> I wasn't going to answer the question myself. I was going to wait. <laughs> so the, the, the church instituted it. Um, and why, why did the church institute it? <laughs> Why did the church think this would be a good idea? It was, I mean, the answer is already there. It's going to help and satisfy the church. Okay. It was strictly for their own benefit. Um, to, to go back a little bit, was there anything in scripture to suggest to do such a thing? No. 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 No, so there, there was nothing in scripture. So it wasn't like they were reading scripture and found, oh, here's some truth we've been missing all these years. And we need to teach this now. And we need to bring this out. It was strictly that by instituting this, they were able to, to bring more people in. And therefore, as so much of this world goes, help line their pockets a little deeper. Um, so the church was doing this just for their own, basically glorification for their own gain. Um, and so this was in the past. Now, when we come up to the time of the 1800s, which still for us was the past, but at the time in which the lesson was, was written, the question is, why are the laws enacted at this time? Now, Keith, I see you got your hand up. Go ahead. So I wanted to challenge you about on this specific topic. I, in, the, in the chat, I'm going to post everything that I say. Daniel 7.25 actually says, and he shall speak great words against the Most High, and he shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws. So it is actually prophesied in scripture that they would change things. Um, and the, hence, hence the reason to do the Sunday law. So it's not entirely true that, and, and we were told that this was going to happen. 
I agree. We were told ahead of time that this would take place and you still have your hand up on the other one there. Um, I agree. We were told ahead of time that this would take place. Because God prophesied it, that's not why things happen, though. God doesn't prophesy something and then make it come to be. God prophesies it because he knows that later it's going to come to be. And so the question with that, um, the way I look at it is, why does he say, um, I mean, he knows it's going to happen. Why does it take place? And the, the church didn't do it just to go against God, um, although we know they're doing that, but they're doing it um, for the purpose of exalting themselves. They're following a different leader than the one true God. Go ahead. Again, in the comments, I posted 2 Thessalonians 2.10, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, and this is the key, because they received not the love of the truth. So just because you're part of the truth doesn't, the church doesn't mean you necessarily love the truth. Correct. And that, and so part of that, it's the dichotomy where you're part of the church and you think you're in the right, but if you don't study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman need not be ashamed rightly dividing the word of God. If you don't know how to divide the word of God, then you will be swept into error. And that's part of the reasons why this Sunday law will be instituted. Okay, I don't dispute any of that at all. I agree with you there. Um, and, you know, it's, we can look at the Pharisees, and that's a good example of, of this as well. The Pharisees, take, well, take Paul, for instance. Paul, in all the persecuting of the church that he was doing, he thought he was doing this for God the whole time. This is what God would have him to do. Now, we know he was very much in error, just like many of the laws that the Pharisees had added to the scriptures over time. They were very much in error doing this, but they thought they were doing the will of God. They thought they were doing this to honor God. And so we find things like that in the church quite frequently. But as Brother Keith said, if we don't study the scriptures to really know what they say, then we don't really know whether what we're doing is in accordance with God or whether it's not. Yes, Tennessee. Yeah, just to um, backtrack, as we talk about the time period that when this quarter was written in the um, 1880s, 1889, um, it was talking about like the first time when the Sunday law basically was, um, came about. And a little backtrack, I'm not probably the expert on this, but, um, you know, uh, the church, I think back then, they, of course, Satan had a master plan and he was mm -hmm. using the church. And um, there was a time, and I know Keith is probably a, a history buff on this, where um, Judah, it, Judaism, like Saturday was kind of like mostly looked at for the Jewish kind of thing. And they wanted the, the, the Christian basically kind of um, kind of like separate themselves from the Jewish, the Jewish people and, and not just the Jewish people too. It's like you had the pagan, the pagans, Constantine and all that, the pagan people wanted to be a part of the church and to make it, you know, this is probably kind of like the rationales, part of it to make them more comfortable. They brought in some of their gods like Jupiter, they, they brought it in the statue and called it Peter and they did all of that thing. So yes, it was to further the church, you know what? All these people are pagan. They want to be a part of us. They worship the sun on Sunday. You know, let's start doing that. And as we know, it came in subtly. They were doing Sabbath worship, Saturday, the true Sabbath, and the Sunday worship. Then they make Saturday the day of fasting, Sunday the day of feasting. Then eventually they kind of squash, put the laws in place to squash out Sabbath keeping. So yes, 
He wants to further the means of the church. That's what the people believe. That's what the leaders of the church believe, in, believe not realizing that they were furthering the cause of the enemy. No, as it says, you said, no, what is it? No, no, in acted and no in question number three is talking about no in 1888, 89. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Question 23, it says, for the same reason, the church have their agenda and they are pushing it. But as um, 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 Dr. Keith says, we know prophecy and it's going to happen. And of course, we, we talked about it in previous lesson about, you know, Alonzo um, T. Jones, who went to defend liberty, freedom of worship and all of that. We also talk in the past how there are still today in the USA, many laws protecting Sunday as the Lord's Day is on the books, on the law books of America. They're just not being enforced, but they are there. Thankfully, the the the. It was not as widespread. It was not, you know, continued to be enforced. <laughs> However, we are coming up onto a time when it will be again. Why? Prophecy tells us, and just like you said, Brother Rob, I, I agree wholeheartedly, because God knows something is going to happen, that doesn't make it happen. You know, we talk about, we have talked about example where you see there's a, there's a tunnel and one track going into the tunnel, you know, and the train, you have two tunnels. One train is to go the train to the right and one to the, um, to the opposite direction. And the train missed the track, one track going to the tunnel and, and, and there are two trains coming in the opposite direction at full speed. If they had the brakes not working. The fact that you know, man, these two trains are going to go and they're going to have a head-on collision because everything points to that. Don't make it happen. You know what I'm saying? So I'm right there with you. God knew these things are going to happen. And if God knows something is going to happen, because he knows it's going to happen, it, 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 you know, he doesn't make it happen. He knows it's going to happen. So the same thing and why we need to know why the Sunday law came up first, why it came up again. It's important because it's going to give us a good idea of um, what how it's going to come about in our days because it is coming about in our days. All the things are, the pieces are being fit together. But I tell you what, Satan has gotten more wise. And it's not just coming from a one point perspective. It's saying the, the main power at the top that is pushing it is the same. But it's coming from different angles, but it's all coming together in yes and we'll be seeing it soon i believe um yeah i i i agree with that and now when we look at it and we know that that was happening then we know it's going to take place again soon we as we say in one of our previous lessons the same organization that was behind trying to establish Sunday back in the 1800s is still alive and active today. And they're still trying to do the same thing. They have their website and they even say that on their website. Um, they're trying to get the, the constitution of this country changed to make Sunday a holy day and, and set apart. Now, the the lesson here asks two questions is the church caesar and the, the reason it's asking this is does the government basically have the the right to make such a law to enforce sunday knowing that the the bigger part of it is really about worship does the government have that right? And is the church really the government to where it can institute that? And of course, we know part of the, the foundations of the government here in this country is the separation of church and state. Now, many people have taken that way beyond where it should be, that there can be no religious thought no no god guiding thoughts within government that's the extent some people are taking from it but that's not the idea of it the true idea is that the government 
does not make any laws forcing worship of any kind nor prohibiting worship of any kind. That's what's actually written in the Constitution. Um, and the next question, is the church God? Is the church God? Oh. No. You know, I remember back when I was in the eighth grade learning evolution, I had grew up in church being taught God created the world. And I came home one day from school and I asked my mom, I says, Mom, you know, the church is teaching us that we're created. School, they're teaching us about evolution and coming from, from apes and all. I said, what am I supposed to believe? And what I remember her saying at that time, it wasn't believe science, it wasn't believe the church, it was believe what the Bible says, which was interesting because we didn't study the Bible at home. We didn't really study the Bible at church. I grew up a Catholic. I mean, we would have a couple of readings each week, but even what the, the priest talked about wasn't necessarily didn't necessarily have anything to do with the readings that were read from scripture. Um, but she said, believe what the Bible says. At that time, I didn't understand the difference. What the Bible says is what the church teaches was my thought. Not that they were God, but that's at least what they taught. I have learned since then that so many churches don't really teach what the Bible says. And true, that the, the Bible is God's word, and if they're teaching something that's not what the Bible says, then they're teaching contrary to God's word. You definitely are not God if you're teaching contrary to God's own word. And so really, if the church is, is not the government, and the church is not God, then the church really has no authority to establish anything. The church's only real authority is to uplift what God has already given us in his word. It's not that we come up with something new, not that we search the scriptures or, or search our brains or whatever to find something new that nobody else knows or nobody else is doing. That's not our purpose. Our purpose as the church is to understand the word that God has given us and to teach that. Sunday keeping is nowhere in God's word. Um, Yolaine, go ahead. Uh, for, for the ancient church, we can say that God is not the church, but for our time, we can say that uh, Christ is the head of the church and we are the body. Ancient church that we are studying right now, God is not the church. But in our time, we know that Christ is the head of the church and we are the body. So there is a, a discussion, that discussion that can be made because uh, this is a tricky question. The real church, the good church, the church of God, we are part of it and God is the head. But ancient study, as we are doing right now, we know that the Catholic Church is not uh, really, is not, uh, God is not the head of that church. That's what I can say. I would agree with you. Um, but God is not the head of it because they choose for God not to be. As, <laughs> as God's people, what we should be doing is, is like I said, we, our purpose is to uplift God, uplift his word. And if we're not doing that, we, I don't see how we can even claim to be God's church. I see the ancient church that we are studying now, we cannot claim that God is the church, but for our time that us Christians believing in Christ and doing his will, we have Christ as the head and us the body, each member with a different part to do different things. The, the, the qualifier there is if we are following God, like you said, yes. and so many other churches aren't. So even most of the churches, we can't even say God's the head of it. He wants to be, 
but are we allowing him to be? And in most of our churches today, we're not allowing him to be. Now, we do know um, from the scriptures that Sunday keeping is it's not just a matter of, um, well, let me rephrase that. The, the push for Sunday is to make Sunday or to make people believe that Sunday is God's holy day. To honor it as a biblical thing, to honor it as, as if it is God's, and us knowing, of course, that it's not, that it is nothing God instituted, we know that it doesn't really honor God, but it honors whoever it is instituting it, which is basically the church and then whatever governments they can get to do this along with them. The thing we have to keep in mind, although we know that the ultimate goal is to make it a day um, of worship and to honor him who instituted it, which would be ultimately the devil, but even prior to that, the papacy, the church. That does not mean that's necessarily how it's going to come in to being. We have all kinds of laws seeking to be passed right now to take the time off of work for Sunday, close Sunday down for all kinds of activities, setting Sunday apart as a day different than every other day of the week for economic reasons. If we do this, it'll be better for our economy. It'll be better for the income of everybody involved. Um, we also, um, that we're, we're doing it for environmental reasons. If we shut down businesses on, on Sabbath or on, on Sunday, then it's gonna help our, our environment a lot. There won't be so much pollution be it from the businesses or from the cars of everybody traveling, all that type of stuff. And so it's going to take one day a week and allow the atmosphere to breathe, basically. We're coming in with things um, it, it, for mental health, for physical health. They're coming out with all different kinds of reasons to set one day apart. The thing is, it's always that it's Sunday. It's not just any arbitrary day. Although they did start out, you know, everybody needs to take one day. Now they're starting to focus it all in on it needs to be the church. Or, I mean, needs to be Sunday. They're not, they're, they're taking it away from being a church type of thing and finding ways to to um, include everybody who wants nothing to do with God or church or who might worship God on a different day. They're still trying to bring it around to Sunday for, for everybody. So, you know, I know in the past, I was very um, focused, I guess, that blinders on that it was all going to be come in a certain way. We have to be careful about that. Otherwise, it's going to take us by surprise. Now, Keith, I see you keep posting things in the chat. I can tell you, for me personally, I can't read them right now. So if there's something you want to share, I'm happy for you to speak up and share it. No, I'm, I'm basically, this is all validation of everything you guys are saying. You guys need proof when you talk to people. You can't just say words. The words of Rob have not been canonized. And True. so it does for you to say your opinion. But when you guys can demonstrate proof, the, the most recent hyperlink that I gave is a 74-page document documenting the admissions of the Catholic Church that the Sabbath 
is actually on Saturday. Specifically, the one I quoted here is from page two, and I'm going to read it to you. Uh, regarding the change from the observance of the Jewish Sabbath to the Sunday Christian Sunday, I wish to draw your attention to the facts. There's three facts, no, two facts. Number one, that Protestants who accept the Bible as the only rule of faith in religion should by all means go back to the observance of Sabbath. The fact that they do not, but on the contrary, observe the Sunday, stultifies them in the eye of every, and here's the word they use, thinking man. So that means the reasonable conclusion is if you're going to follow the Bible, you will follow the a Saturday Sabbath. And then number two reason, we Catholics do not accept the Bible as the only rule of faith. Besides the Bible, we have the living church, the authority of the church as a rule to guide us. We say this church instituted by Christ to teach and guide man through life has the right to change ceremonial laws of the Old Testament. And hence, we accept her change to the Sabbath to Sunday. We frankly say yes to the church made this change, made this law. And as she has made other laws, for instance, the Friday abstinence, the unmarried priesthood, the laws concerning mixed marriages, the regulation of Catholic marriages and a thousand other laws. It is always somewhat laughable to see Protestant churches in the pulpit led and legislation demand the observance for Sunday, of which there is nothing in their Bible. Peter Kramer, Catholic Church Extension, 1975. I, I'm glad to, I was going to ask you the date on it because, you know, I'm not a great one for being able to search the internet and find what I'm looking for. But most of the stuff you find like that seems to be back from the 1700s, maybe the 1800s, something like that, or it's on an Adventist website. Um, I was trying to find something more modern, and what I found recently is a, a Catholic Bible and Answer program, radio program, and it was a transcript where the guy actually says on there, that, oh, no, the Catholic Church didn't institute this. We're just following what Scripture says and gives his reasons for that. And so they're actually changing what they've been saying for these several hundred years now. Um, they're starting to change that. To, to have a reference that's a lot more recent than 100 years ago, uh, um, I will get that copied down. Yeah, Thank so you. just go to... I put a whole bunch of things in there. I forgot. So guys, as you talk, I'm basically finding evidence for what you say. The other thing I wanted to highlight was um, we talked about religious uh, uh, rights and discrimination. Um, I know personally, I had to deal with this in terms of the COVID uh, vaccination for work. And so one of the resources that you can use is the EEOC. This is a governmental agency, which actually protects your rights as a, um, as a citizen. So you do not have, the, your employer does not have the right to enforce their law, their religion. On, you can actually claim a religious exemption for the COVID vaccine. I quoted, and if you know what the law is, you can actually quote it in your defense. And when people see that you understand the law, they think twice about trying to fire you. And you guys need to know, you guys need to be, you need to understand what your rights are. Because remember, we still live in a free country. OK, <laughs> that's a, and that's a good thing. But there will come a time where uh, uh, every principle of the Constitution will be repudiated. Right now, they're trying to take away the Second Amendment. There's a constant buzz about trying to take away your guns. Once they take away your guns, they're going to take away freedom of speech. They're going to take away freedom of religion. So this is the sequence of which these things are going to happen. So pay attention closely how these events are happening in the news. This isn't, a, this isn't just happenstance. And if you notice, the Catholic Church is not actively being involved in any of this. Rather, these are Jesuits who are playing both sides of the aisle. And they are playing both sides on purpose to a final conclusion. And then once that final conclusion comes, the final act of the drama starts. And then the curtain goes up, and then everything we've known and everything we've studied starts to actually come to fruition. Amen. Yes, Sister Kaz. Okay, so um, Brother Keith posted something in the chat where he says, we Catholics do not accept the Bible as the only rule of faith. And so people should be aware that once the Bible is is, isn't the only rule of faith. 
But we should also question what else do they accept as their rule of faith because they do not accept the Bible as their only rule of faith. And they, they did put it down though. They said, besides the Bible, we have the living church, the authority of the church. And the question was asked in the beginning of the study, who authorized, who authorized Sunday? No, because they believe that they have the authority of the church as a rule to guide them. They say this church instituted by Christ to teach and guide. So they believe that the Catholic church really is instituted by Christ to teach and guide man through life, has the right to change the ceremonial laws. And as you were talking, Brother Rob, what came to my mind was that one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is, one of the gifts of the Spirit of Christ is prophecy. And this gift has been the identifying mark of the remnant church and was manifested in the ministry of Ellen G. White. And as the Lord's messenger, her writings are a continuing and authoritative source of truth which provide for the church comfort, guidance, instruction, and correction. And they also make clear that the Bible is a standard by which all teachings and experience must be tested. So that deception from the Catholic church is very clear. And therefore, that's, that's where people now are questioning they being the vice gerent of Christ on earth, they being Christ on earth, because they are simply putting out there that they have all the authority to change whatever they want to change in the Bible. And um, something else that Brother Keith has said, um, this is something that we have been stating, not just on Facebook, but even on a local level, where we're, they're, they're seeking to change the second amendment true and they are seeking to take away your freedom of speech your freedom to worship and that the last one that will be is your freedom to worship on the day when you want when you when you desire to worship so that's also from the catholic church so even though the catholic even though the pope is silent behind all of it and the jesuits are how they're playing both sides of the fence both political and religious I should say, we know that the Catholic Church and the authority of the Catholic Church is behind all of that. Yes. And of course, we know that the ultimate force behind it all is the devil because he's trying to institute his whole his own thing. And we need to make sure we keep all this in mind. And we, I, as believers in the one true God, we need to keep in mind our fights not with the Catholic Church, it's with the devil himself. And the Catholic Church is the instrument that he's using, but we need to make sure that we keep the picture clear or we're going to get lost in it. Um, but we do need to keep all these things in mind. And definitely, you know, as we as things continue on, there are going to be many very compelling reasons to do what they're trying to do, um, basically in order to honor Sunday as well as other things. And we need to keep in mind that it doesn't matter how compelling a reason there is, we cannot go against the scriptures whatsoever. Now, this actually, this leads us into the, the next lesson of the study guide, which now we're entering lesson number 12. And the, the title now is The Last Message of Mercy. But the first question basically continues with what we've been talking about. It says, how great will be the, how great will be the pressure to compel all to keep Sunday in this nation? So, in other words, what's going to be done in order to try and convince us to go along with these Sunday laws? I see Donna raised her hand. 
Well, I can imagine, at least in for like the youth and people into pop culture, because when like all the voting happens, all the favorite celebrities say, oh, go vote for this. And when the vaccine came, they're like, everyone, come on, get your vaccines. And then everyone follows because their favorite singers say, so I'm sure they're going to have some say about all this too. And be like, you know, I'm worshiping on Sunday and get all the young people who follow the celebrities to do that. Talking about pop culture, there is actually a song out by what the guy that was running for president one time that married to the Kardashian. Kanye West. Kanye West. He has a song about rest on Sunday. He has his own church now. Yeah. So he has so so in terms of using pop culture and all of that, I mean, the, everything will be used, but we have the scripture, and I think you're probably going to turn to the scripture here about how great the pressure will be. Because those, when the pop culture and the other people telling you, do this, do this, this is fun, that's kind of encouraging you to do it. Especially for the youth, you know? Yeah. Because when they see their idol and their celebrity and all their friends love this singer too, they're like, you know, I'm going to do it. You know, what's her name says she's going to do it. So I can, I can definitely see that. All right. So that's encouragement, but apart from the encouragement, then the pressure is going to come on. So we're going to read revelation now 13, 15 to 17 to see the pressure, because that's how with everything that they have tried to institute, you mentioned that, you know, the, the job earlier, it was nice suggestion. Let's take it. Then the pressure, you're going to lose your job. You can't travel. You can't this. So we're going to have friendly encouragement, as you said, and people want to influence, of course, using the church leaders. We were talking about that last night, how they use pastors and stuff to influence people. But then when that doesn't accomplish what they want to accomplish, the pressure will be on. You're going to read it, Donovan? It, Donovan has his Bible to read Revelation 13, 15 to 17. Okay. <clears throat> Revelation 13, verse 15 to 17. Verse 15. And he had the power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he called it all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Okay, so what's this tell us is going to be the pressure? What kind of pressure are they going to put out? Sure, sure. To begin with, it will be just to try and influence us, like you're saying, these influencers, social media, this type of thing. Then it's going to be, you know, just the peer pressure. Oh, do it for this reason. Do it for that reason. Taking the jab. If you love old people, get it, because otherwise you're going to kill them. Um, so they do that kind of pressure. But what's this say is going to be the, the compelling pressure, really, to not be able to buy it sell. can't buy or sell Danny said can't buy or sell but eventually it said kill you your life is good first of all if you can't buy and sell in today's society for most people what would I, well we'd eventually die most people cannot live without buying and selling because how do you get your food? How do you get your water? How do you get your thing? That's how most of the world live. And that's going to kill you anyway. But apart from the natural debt that you'll buy, not being able to do that, they're going to put laws to kill you. Um, Danny wants to say something. And and just like how they demonize the people who didn't get the vaccine, they'll demonize people who don't go on Sunday too. So when, you know, they are starting to kill us, no one's, they're going to think it's right. And like, you know, Donnie mentioned demonizing, but remember, we are, people are also becoming desensitized to prepare them to do that. Um, most of us did not watch that movie, and I didn't watch it either. But you remember the movie about the white, it's not what they call it. Um, the, the recent movie it was last year or the year before, where you have some aliens who go into a cocoon on Saturdays. And they're called the white something another. There was a movie that came out and it was a war. And, um, you know, people had to come from the future to go back to kill these aliens 
who keep this one day, the best day to get them is on the seventh day of the week when they go into this cocoon. And I don't remember they call them white one. Nobody remembers that that, that movie. I remember yeah. it, but I don't remember the name. I don't remember the name. And it's just funny that they call him the white something another. And I'm like, I wonder if this have any allusion to Ellen White. You know what I'm saying? So <laughs> they 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 do, I can't remember the name of the movie right now, but there are people who have watched the movie and screened it and you know present clips. These are some of the things to tell you. These people who keep this one day, this they are aliens. And you need to rid the earth of them. That was a gist. Or else they are going to destroy the planet. Because remember now, Sabbath, working um, on Sunday, one of the, the goal is to save the planet. Because if we don't do something drastic about climate change, our, our, the, the kids won't have anywhere to live. You know, so it's going to be very, very interesting. And I already see them. Even with the vaccine, mm -hmm. people were talking about tomorrow war. Tomorrow to, war. Tomorrow war. Sister, is who put? Oh, who put it? But um, Dr. Mm -hmm. King. Okay. Wanting to kill people who didn't get the vaccine. That it's better, you know, because so they're and if they can say something like that, you know, flippantly, they'll obviously say that. And like she said, they're going to say we're destroying the earth and all that nonsense. Um, oh, it's yeah, very clear, know. guys. It's listen. I've heard brother Donovan read something from Revelation 13, but it has been prophesied. This, this thing that's going on, this ongoing human genocide that's happening, no. It was prophesied because in Revelation 18, in Revelation 18, we were told that, let me see if I can find that, the light of a candle, shall no more shine at all in thee. And what's the light of a candle? It is the truth of God. Because the people are literally living in darkness. And the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth, and by their sorceries were all nation deceived. Now we know that big pharma and the hospitals, the private doctors, the clinics who are issuing all these drugs are benefiting. And the hearth has literally turned away from the health message. Even if they do not know about the health message that LNG White had received to give to the world, then many of them read it in Genesis chapter one and two about that health message there. But instead, we turn away from that message to eating what the Babylonians are actually eating. And what came to my mind was that Daniel stood up and he refused the meat and the wine from the king's table. And he asked for the food that God had in his great mercy given to the earthly population. No, we are being told by the word pharmacy. Pharmacy are chemists, because in England, they use the word chemist, not pharmacy. It is from the Greek word pharmakia. And pharmakia means sorcery. It means sorceries in Revelation 18 and it's magical hearts, and it is the use of administering drugs, and it is often found in connection with idolatry. And if you put the original Greek word pharmakia in place of the English word sorceries, the end of the verse which says, for by thy pharmakia were all nations deceived, for by sorcery, is where we get our English word pharmacy. And pharmacy is a well-organized and professionalized system that, admini that administered, sorry, poisonous drugs. And the Bible reveals that Babylon will deceive all nations by the use of pharmacy that is in connection to magical arts and idolatry and sorcery. And magical arts has its deep roots in witchcraft and the occultic world. And I have said it this morning in 1 Samuel, and I'm not sure if it's 1 Samuel 15 
are first Samuel 23, which tells us about um by how uh, which actually was saying was it 12 23? No, it is 23 verse 12. So um 23 verse 12, and I'm actually trying to say it because this is simple saying to me that many of us No, it's not. I can't seem to find it. Well, anyway, uh, I think um, Dr. Keith put it in the chat. Are you talking about First Samuel fifteen twenty three about the 15, sin of rebel for rebellion? Is as a sin of witchcraft? It's in the many of us. Oh yes, Sister Faith. Thank you very much for that, and thank you, Brother Keith. Um, it is because of the sin of rebellion when millions are dying because of this drug. But I mean, vaccines that was given. And I'm simply saying it is because we have simply walk away from the word of God and Ezekiel chapter eight, which tells us that. And I keep telling people that even though that those verses were talking about ancient Israel, they still apply to modern Israel. They have turned their backs to God and have turned their faces to the sun. All of what is going on now, all of what we are accepting is from the pit of hell used by the Catholic Church. All of it. And we are still rebelling against God, which is sorcery, which is witchcraft, idolatry, all of it. So if we can't get it right now, when are we going to prepare? I, and I'm I agree with I agree with everything you said, but we got to take it another step. It's not just being used by the Catholic Church. It's being used by all churches. It's being used by everybody who is not a firm believer and follower of our Lord Jesus Christ and the one true God. We can't, we, we have to be very careful that we do not limit it to one church or one country or anything like that. Um, what, what was read in the scripture in Revelation that, that Donovan read, it's not only that no man might buy or sell, which is what we harp on all the time. That's what we talk about and talk about and talk about. But as Faith pointed out before it even says that, it says that they're going to kill us. Now, we also need to look at Matthew 24, 9, because Matthew 24, 9 talks about the same time. And it says, they shall deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. So it's not just that they're trying to bring us into line. We are going, if we stand firm on the word of God, we're going to be hated by everyone, which is one of the reasons they're going to think that it's okay to kill us. And if you, I don't, I don't know what it's like in the other governments around the world, but I'm, living in the United States, looking at what's going on here, what I keep seeing is I, I see it being propagated by the government in so many ways, but not only government, but by both the, the social media platforms, the news platforms, pretty much everything. They are trying to divide us in every way they possibly can. They're dividing us on economic grounds. They're dividing us on um, political grounds. They're dividing us on racial grounds. They're dividing us um, pretty much every way they can so that, you know, even if we hold to the same political views, well, then they bring in something to divide us there. And even whoever we still hold fast to and, and agree with them, then they find something else in order to divide us because the more they can divide everybody up, the easier we are to conquer and control. 
And that's what's ultimately is going to be. And for those that they can't get that kind of control, then it's just, we're enemies of everybody. Look how crazy these people are. These are the, these people have mental health issues. They don't think like anybody else does. They, they're, they're warped. And, you know, even the, the, the Pope has already come out and talked about those who really hold fast to what the scriptures say are a threat to the whole society and to, to Jesus Christ himself. And, and so, I mean, we're already being set up to be taken down big time. But what we have to remember, if we look at what Revelation 13 says, um, how they're going to compel us to receive the mark of the beast, in other words, to follow after anything contrary to God, they're going to set all these things up. Well, in Revelation 14, keep in mind what God says there. Babylon's going to fall. So all these trying to force this stuff upon us, they're coming down. It's those who stand firm with God that are going to actually last. And even if they take our life in this world, that is not the end. We are promised the resurrection. We are promised eternal life with God our Father. And so regardless of what they can do here, that doesn't amount to anything compared to what we're going to receive. So we have to always keep that in mind. This, what happens here is not the end by any means. Yes, Brother Keith. There, there has been a lot touched on, uh, many of which are entire sermons that I've already preached. So I will just uh, keep my very limited. Um, Sister Kaz already alluded to uh, Re uh, Revelation 18.23. Um, one of the things that you guys need to know about Revelation 13.15, that this is already in the news. I don't know if you guys already know this. Are you guys familiar with this? Be more specific in what you're saying. So if you go back to about, let me see where I posted it. Um, at about 11.30, in the, just above post Tomorrow War, where I wrote Tomorrow War, there's an executive summary for Project Hamilton. If you guys haven't heard about Project Hamilton, two-year project between the central bank and MIT to prove that central bank digital currency is feasible. This is the method by which this is going to be instituted. So what they're, this is, an, uh, my family, we took a trip to Mongolia, a mission trip to Mongolia a couple of years ago. And the police state is actually very much in effect in China. It's already there. All the traffic is already there. And they're slowly trying to bring uh, all those elements to the United States. Um, the next time you're out in the city, look to see how many surveillance cameras are out everywhere you go whether it be at this, uh, this, the corner of a, a convenience store, over at a drive-through, almost every store has an exterior facing uh, surveillance camera. There's not a single place you can go in a major city these days that is not completely surveyed. And this, these are all elements that we have to realize are actually being set up all around you, but you are uh, ignorant to these uh, issues. So this Revelation 13 should not take us by surprise, but rather these, have been slowly been instituted right underneath our noses and when you start to open your eyes to this you'll realize that we are being warned um and the the warning i want to give uh um is the warning that, uh, jesus gave um jesus gave a very ominous warning uh when he said um he, he made something he made a very interesting statement um he referenced the coming of the son of man uh based on two prior Bible characters. Do you guys know who this is? Do you know who the two characters that by Jesus actually referenced? Noah and Lot. Noah, why, why Lot specifically? Notice that when pre-incarnate Christ came to visit Abraham, he already knew there weren't 10. He already knew there weren't 50. So Sodom and Gomorrah should have already been destroyed. Notice that 
only after Lot was warned and Lot left the city did the destruction of Asai and Gomorrah actually happen. Consider this, the country living message is actually not just to live into the country, but this is the last message of warning that God is giving to his people to leave the city before they're destroyed. When you consider it in that way, now all of a sudden it has a biblical mandate. It's not just, are oh, there are these crazy people who are going to go out and prep, but there's actually merit, and these words are in red. Um, and then to Sister Kaz's point, she referenced Daniel about a him uh, um, purposing in his heart that he wouldn't defile himself. There is a passage in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 10, 11, where it talks about all of these were given to us as in samples. When you look at the first six chapters of Daniel, each one of those tackles a major event in the life of Daniel, which actually will mirror our experience at the end of time, culminating in what Sister Faye, or actually Sister Donay said, where we will be killed for our beliefs. And that's Daniel and the lion's Daniel 1 talks about a health crisis where Daniel decides purposes in his heart that he would not defile himself. I just want to, I want to speak to that specific context of defile. Notice that Daniel at that time was made to be a eunuch. If you guys don't understand what a eunuch is, you guys should just Google it for yourself. Daniel had already been physically defiled. But what he hadn't been done is spiritually defiled. And that's what he intended when, when, when he wrote that. So Daniel said, it doesn't matter what they do to me physically, they will not defile me spiritually. And Daniel kept that. Each successive challenge that is presented in each of the successive chapters in Daniel represents a challenge that we have already been told will happen to us. And if you wish to study that back, and I'll explain all those in more detail because it's beyond the scope of a Sabbath school lesson. Uh, yeah, I'd really like to hear you explain it all out because I, I can see what you're saying. I've never thought about it in that way with, with Daniel, um, but I can already begin to see what you're talking about. That would be a great study to do. Um, so anyway, with all this, we have covered a, a, a lot today. We, we've talked about a lot. We, we see what's coming towards us. We see the, the veracity that they're going to come at us with. Um, and, you know, the, the last couple of verses we share help point that out, that it's not just a plan that they have, but the extent that they're willing to go to it, where we're going to be hated, we're going to be the, um, the, the, necessities of life are going to be withheld from us we're going to be killed if we choose to stand firm with god we have to make a decision each and every one of us just like daniel did we have to make a decision how far am i willing to go am i going to stand against these things am i going to purpose in my heart now that I will not be defiled, that I will not go against the word of God, that I will stand firm with God, come what may. They can do to me whatever they want to do, but I'm going to stand firm with God. Or, you know, are we going to just kind of be a little wishy-washy about it and I'll see how far I can handle it. If you're going to just take that kind of attitude, I'll see how far I can go. I can tell you you're going to fall because you're not already, you're not depending upon God. You're not making it so that, you know, you're not taking a firm stance. And if we don't take a firm stance, we won't survive it, period. So we have to purpose in our hearts today. Yes, Sister Yolene. Yes, Bodo. as you just said, in everything we are studying today, we have to have one word of faith, knowing, knowing that where we are anchored, because we have a Savior. We have the one who has the power to do and undo. Christ alone, that's what we need. We should stand by him, and no matter what the situation, 
know that he is with us and for us. Without that, we can do nothing. Without Christ, we are nothing. That's the last word. Trust him and wait on him. He will take care of us at any moment. Absolutely. And brother, Ron, yes, excuse me, five minutes remain. Okay. Um, Wednesday night, Don A was leading our study and she read Romans chapter eight. Um, I don't think she, she read the entire thing, but read quite a portion of it. But one of the verses that goes that really stood out to me and I think really goes along with what we're talking about here is Romans 8, 18, where Paul writes, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. We need to hold on to what, keep reviewing our past, and seeing how God has led us, and know that he is going to be, just as he's been faithful in the past, he will be faithful in the future. Um, and not only that, but regardless of how bad things get in, in our future, this right here is a promise that should be able to help carry us through. If we believe God, if we trust him, and then we know that whatever we go through in this world is nothing, nothing compared to that which we're going to receive. And so it should give us strength to hold firm with God, even when everything else seems hopeless. God is true with his word. Every promise he's given you is truth. Hold fast to it. Even when it doesn't look like it's truth, hold fast to it because it is truth. Yes, Faye. Um, it was me. I okay. remember the exact verse, but this is something I remembered when you said that, how they say when, I think it was Jesus said, when they bring us in to, um, to ask us questions and not to prepare what we're gonna say because the Holy Spirit's gonna inspire us in that moment. And I think that's comforting to know that even as they're torturing us, you know, God's still going to be with us through it, too. So even though we're in physical pain, you know, that God's still with us. Absolutely. God. It, one of the verses I've always held on to is, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Our God, um, he, he, he's already shown his great love for us. He's not going to stop it now. Yes, Sister Cass. As you were talking, what came to my mind, um, I had spoken about Daniel and Brother Keith had expounded upon that. And then you had said something. And after Danny, I mean, spoke about that particular verse and Sister Pay know that that verse is something that we use to encourage <clears throat> others on Facebook, even in helping others to know that it is Christ in us, the hope of glory, who will be speaking to us when we appear before earthly pontificates. So I'm saying that with Daniel, in, in reaching whatever decision he had reached, Daniel did not act out, I mean, out of presumptuousness. Daniel, in firm reliance upon God, acted. So in every decision that he made, he, he, he prayed about it, he gave it to God, and God, and God through his spirit directed him. And I believe that's what we should do. We shouldn't act presumptuously upon our own, I mean, I mean, upon our own merits or whatever we believe that oh, um, has come to our mind. And because sometimes not everything that appears in our heart and in our mind is of God. But as you have rightly said, we should study the word of God and listen to the voice of God as we studied and pray. You know, so I strongly believe that. Okay. Yeah, and, and God, God will always be faithful. 
that's the one thing we can hold on to. So let us close with prayer. Okay. Our Father God, we thank you so much for your word, for the insights you give us through it, the, the prophecies to help us to, to know what is ahead of us so that these things don't need to take us by surprise, but you have told us beforehand what's going to take place. And through that, we know that we can trust you. We, we, we've seen it in the past. And so we know that what you tell us for the future is going to be true as well. Father, help us to, to continually look at what you've done for us in the past and how you've brought us to where we are so that we will know that wherever it is we currently are, that you will take us through it as well. Help us to stay in your word, to read your promises and, and know that they are true because you are true. And that regardless of what comes upon us, we know that we can trust you. We know that you'll carry us through. Even if we should have to give our lives for you, we know we have the promise of the resurrection on the end. The, help us not to hold so tight to this life and the things of this life that we let go of you, but help us to hold so firm to you that we're willing to let go of everything that has it to do with this life. So Father, help us in, in all things that we will bring glory to your name and that, that through us standing boldly for you, come what may, that it will also draw others unto you, that your kingdom may be full and that you may truly be honored and glorified always. We pray these things in the holy name of your son and by the power he's given to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you.